Um, topic is immunotherapy in colorectal cancer. We all know that immunotherapy is becoming more and more important even in the routine treatment of, of cancer patients. Last week at the ESCO meeting, immunotherapy was the hot topic. We are all impressed by the clinical data that we see now in, in different solid tumor diseases using checkpoint inhibitors. Nobody really knows which patients benefit from those treatments, so what we really need to do is to understand um, tumor-host interactions much better and what we will learn in this session, how do we really assess how the immune system is interacting with, with tumors, how can we convince the immune system to actually recognize tumor cells better and, and reject tumor cells. And we will hear about different strategies, how we can intelligently interfere there. Well, we would like to start with the first presentation given by Niels Halama, who's heading a, a research group at the NCT, and his focus is, is actually the, the exploration and, and better understanding of tumor-host interactions at the tumor level. Um, I will remind every speaker to stick to his time of 15 minutes presentation that we have five, time, five minutes for discussion. Niels. Thank you very much for the kind introduction um, and of course for the invitation to present the data here. Um, I'll speedily go through the uh, clinical aspects of colorectal cancer. I simply would like to remind you that the vast majority of patients that uh, I see, that we see as medical oncologists, already have metastatic disease, especially in the liver and the lungs and in the peritoneal cavity. So these patients uh, are in a very dire situation, the overall survival in this group of patients. If it's not resectable, then it's around 24 to 28 months that they have as overall survival. So one of the key players in decision making in medical oncology is the pathologist. So we heavily depend on the situation where we rely on the pathology report, on the TNM classification for treatment decisions. So whether we need more surgery, we see need adjuvant chemotherapy or palliative treatment largely depends on what is written in this pathology report. So the the field of cancer immunotherapy and cancer immunology has gained some traction and some attention by the press and other media in the last couple of years because there were some spectacular results um, in clinical trials from substances that modulate the immune setup in tumors. But of course, this is a very complex issue because cancer immunology is dependent on the understanding of the crosstalk between not only tumor cells and immune cells, but also on the immune cells themselves. So not only the tumor cells are the players here, but everything else that is or that can be found in the tumor microenvironment, and it's a rather complex situation here. So one of the questions that I would like to pose for this talk is, where are the immune cells and are they important? I think the last part of this question is already answered and there have been multiple publications addressing this aspect in the last decade. Uh, I picked this one because it was, I think, the initial prominent publication by Jérôme Galland, who practically showed that in primary colorectal cancer, the density of uh, especially effector T cells in the primary tumor is related to the prognosis in these patients. So the ones here with the red lines are those patients that have a high infiltrate density, have a high density of these effector T cells within the tumor microenvironment, and they live much longer than those who don't, which are the black lines here. And that could be shown across a varying array of different surface staining uh, in the tissue. So what he used is <clears throat> a platform that's the tissue microarray that's commonly used in large cohort studies where uh, in, with this machine a biopsy core is removed from a donor block and placed into a recipient block and in this fashion you can systematically array these cores into a single block and then by cutting you have roughly 120 patient samples on a single block that you can analyze. However, these cores, and that's a typical example, you see the tumor epithelium here from colorectal cancer, you see the white or whitish stoma and the brown tumor cells, uh, sorry, brown immune cells stained with 3D3. So this core, as you see it here, has roughly the size of 0.1 or 0.3 square millimeters. So it's a tiny piece of tissue that you can evaluate here for the density of these immune cells. <clears throat> 
Now, if you take a step back and look with an eagle eye view on a primary colorectal cancer, you see that the primary tumor here is much larger than this field of one square millimeter that I just put on here. And just to illustrate this in more detail, I would like to show you the original virtual microscopy slide that we used here, so that you have an idea what we're really dealing with. So, okay. So this is the, practically the, the virtual microscopy slide. What you can see here on the right side is the adjacent normal mucosa, that is as it should be. Then you see here the tumor, that is this large structure um, reaching to the left side. It has um, broken through the muscular layer here and invades the uh, fat tissue of the peritoneum here. And by just Zooming in, you can see that these brown cells, which are T cells, that they lie in clusters. You can find these islands here, and there's an uneven distribution of these immune cells in this situation. Now, coming back to this one square millimeter, just to highlight this, what you really see then in this one square millimeter is just this part that you can see right now. And now the question, of course, is, is this relevant for the rest of this primary tumor? Does this tell us um, about the density of the immune cells just by looking at this tiny piece? And um, the hypothesis here is that, um, that indeed this is like looking through a keyhole. It's extremely difficult to judge what is behind that, what you really see there. And the answer can only be gained by removing that and getting a better view on the details that you can see in the picture. So with this hypothesis, we went on and said the conceptual idea behind that is, if you believe that a tumor and as a structure as a, is like this MC Escher picture where you have devils and angels and they're everywhere, then it doesn't matter where you look. Everywhere you look, you'll see devils and angels, it doesn't matter. But if you think that the tumor tissue is an organic structure, like uh, the right picture here depicting the forest, then you would expect rabbit in rabbit holes and singing birds in treetops. That makes a lot more sense. So at that time point when I started this, it was totally unclear whether this is an even distribution or not. And uh, so what we did, lo and behold, is an automated uh, analysis of the immune cell infiltrates using this uh, tiled array approach where one of these tiles is one square millimeter and an automated quantification of the immune cells that can be found in each tile. So the big surprise came then when we saw how this looks. This is 20 primary tumors, colorectal cancer, no microsatellite instability. And this is a complete uh, section from each of these uh, tumors. And you can see that there are patients like number 16, number 13, or 2 that have on each of these tiles of one square millimeter have an enormous heterogeneity. So just by looking at one square millimeter piece randomly selected will give you nothing. You don't have a clue what the rest will be like. And other patients like number 1, 3, or 18 have a flat homogeneous distribution. So it's a complex situation and you cannot predict anything from just one square millimeter. And this is, of course, of relevance because the situation for a vindual patient is that you want to be as highly robust and reproducible with the data that you generate from these immune cell quantification as possible because you have to make decisions then for a single patient and not for a large cohort. So I think that this analysis in the first in the first place really showed that this automated large-scale analysis of larger tissue sections has its value, especially for individual patients. So the work by Jerome also was very tantalizing in that respect as it questioned that the TNM classification alone is good enough to really robustly predict the prognosis for patients. And actually he claims that it's even better to use this immune uh, quantification scheme to get into the prognostic area here. So when we looked at that, and wondered what is the situation for the advanced stage patients, the stage four patients with metastatic disease. Then the obvious question is, how does the immune setup in the metastatic lesion look like compared to the primary tumor? Because remember that Jerome only looked in the primary tumor, never looked at the metastatic side. And of course, as medical oncologists, the question then was, is there this better immune infiltrate related to a better chemotherapy response? Maybe that might be helping. Because the situation 
for first-line treatment, so that's the first chemotherapy that a patient gets in a palliative setting, is that roughly half of these patients have a benefit from this first-line treatment. So the remaining patients do only have side effects and nothing from it. So if we could show that there's a relation between this immune infiltrate density and this uh, clinical response here, that would be a big step forward. So looking at the uh, metastatic uh, samples from the liver lesions, we saw right away that the vast majority of the T cells are residing at the invasive margin, at the, inv at the interface between the adjacent liver and the tumor cells, and not inside the metastatic lesion. And this was even more um, striking in a situation when we saw that between different patients there were enormous differences. So we had patients like on panel A that didn't have any infiltrate whatsoever, and on the other part of the spectrum we saw that there were lymphoid structures filled with T cells to the brim. So the question then, of course, is, is it those patients with the high infiltrate density that respond to chemotherapy that live longer, or is it those here with the low infiltrate density? And this is a classical example of a patient that responded very well to nodules in the liver <coughs> that went away after four cycles of standard chemotherapy. So what we found actually was that the higher the score, which means practically the higher the number of infiltrating T cells at the invasive margin, the better the response to chemotherapy. So the gray bars mean uh, patient responded after resist criteria, and the length of the bar denotes how long they responded, so how long they stayed on the same regimen, so how long they benefited from this treatment. And what you can see down here below, those patients that were unfortunate enough to do not have enough immune cells at the invasive margin did not respond and progressed rapidly here. So this also translated, not surprisingly enough, into a difference in the progression-free and overall survival. And fortunately enough, we could test this approach in a validation set where we analyzed the infiltrate density and predicted correctly with a sensitivity of 79% and a specificity of 100% the treatment, the chemotherapy outcome here. So in that sense, here, to wrap it up, it is a situation where we think that the effect of T-cell density in the microenvironment, especially in invasive margin, is linked to the treatment outcome and to the treatment response in these patients. Now, the question, too, is how are the primary tumors and the metastasis related in terms of the immune infiltrate density? And to address this question, we looked in couplets of primary tumor and metastatic lesions, and also to get a better idea on how stable the immune infiltrate density is in a single lesion, we looked at different sites and in serial sections also, and looked at the cytokines in addition. And what we found was quite interesting. In the vast majority of patients, I would say in roughly 70%, we saw that there's concordance. So if you have a good prognostic signature of immune cell infiltration in the primary, you see that also appear in the metastatic lesion in the liver. If it's a poor prognostic uh, situation in the primary, you see that also in the liver metastasis. But also we had enough cases of discordance where you could see a good prognostic signature in the primary tumor and a bad signature in the metastatic lesion, but also vice versa, surprisingly. So there is a complex story hidden there that we still don't understand what happens in the way from the primary tumor to the metastatic side with regard to the immune infiltration. The other interesting part is that we analyzed cytokines and chemokines, and what you can see here is four different metastases, and each uh, of these axes represents a single site. And you see that these dots here nicely line up in an almost uh, a direct line, and it practically shows that in terms of the cytokine microenvironment that we find, we see that from one side to the other, it is very stable and reproducible. So in this term, we see that the situation between the primary tumor and the metastatic lesion is that it can be discordant, and in, I think, roughly 20 to 30 percent this is the case. But looking at the single lesion, we see that it's quite homogeneous, and we're able to reproduce these uh, results in different settings. Now, the last question is, how does this immune infiltration change over time with chemotherapy or with other intervention? And of course, can we change and tweak that to uh, increase the number of infiltrating immune cells, so to change the prognosis of these patients? I know that Philip will talk about this more in detail, but I just picked two cases that we published also because I think they're quite telling. This is a sample uh, from a patient with colorectal cancer and lung metastasis. And this metastasis was removed at time point zero, 
and came back in the same spot five years later. And then it was partially removed and the patient received one year filled with chemotherapy and then it was completely removed in the end. What you can see is that in the compartment of the T cells over time, there's not much change, surprisingly enough, even after six years and one year full of chemotherapy. So that practically stayed the same. You see a quite dramatic change in the number of these monocytic CD68 cells, but otherwise it's quite unremarkable. So even after one year filled with chemotherapy, there was no change in the setting of the numbers of these cells there, which was surprising to see. This is another case where the patient was liver metastasis, and this lesion was after pretreatment then removed, but came back half a year later in the same spot. And then there were two more metastatic lesions that were treated with radiofrequency ablation, and one year later it was then completely removed. So what we see here is the completely opposite. You see that the FOX3 cell numbers goes down in a period where nothing on therapy happens, it just disappears. But what we also see is that with, in the interval of the radiofrequency ablation, we see that the CD3 number rapidly increases. So there is something happening. Of course, this is not a clinical trial, and I cannot make the point that this is related to the radiofrequency in itself. But it's tempting to speculate that this is something that's ongoing here. So to wrap this up, I think that the immune cell profiles, as we see it, is a very complex uh, result of an interplay that where we don't well understand how this is related to treatment. But we see that it can remain stable even with chemotherapy and other interventions. And fair enough, there are hints at least that we are able with treatment options like radiofrequency um, ablation and other measures to change the profile for the better for the patient. And with this, I would like to wrap this up and thank the people that have been involved in this project, of course, the Jägers Group, then Nils Grabe and his team at the TIGA, the Tissue Imaging Analysis Center, at the BioQuant in the Systems Biology Building that uh, maintain the scanning facilities and the systems that have shown in these beautiful pictures here, then the surgical department people who have been very, very helpful and supportive here, the pathology department, statistics, and immunology. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Niels. Are there questions? Philip. So you, you, nicely, you nicely showed this homogeneity in cytokine contents at uh, different sites within a single metastasis, right? So what is the cytokine milieu um, uh, among different metastases? Is that also very comparable or do they establish completely different milieus? So the, the answer is also, again, complexity. Um, um, what we see is that typically it's quite similar, but there are ex exceptions, of course, to the rule. And again, it's a picture of 70-30, I would say, where we have concordance. With pretty much that the thing is what we see in the clinic in treatment, that there is a part of these lesions that respond well and others don't. And this is a fraction that we see then also. Peter. Is there an initial information from you or other groups with respect to T-cell receptor heterogeneity or a monomorphic T-cell response in the heavy infiltrates? So Jerome published some data on that uh, using the immunoscope system at that time. And um, what he could show is that in the higher infiltrated um, primary tumors that there are distinct clones that he could see, but it's just that he can sort of make um, assessment of clonality and not specific uh, TCRs that he can identify. So in a low infiltrate density, it appears to be more of a broader, um, broader non-specific TCR repertoire. Niels, what makes some patients being T-cell high and prognostic favorable patients and others not? Is it the tumor that is different or is it the host or the immune response that, that is different? It's a classical hen and egg problem and we're not really sure what drives what and what isn't used by what. So I think the answer as we know it so far is that there are factors that aren't used by the tumor and others that sort of are brought in by the immune system. Uh, we have some data that indicate that there is a factor that comes from the outside, so that's induced by the sort of the host immune response against the tumor that sort of leads T cells there, but this is just preliminary data. Yeah. I'm Could you observe the novel cell infiltration after RSA? 
So we haven't looked in large cohorts, so I cannot make the point in terms of a clinical trial where we have comparison between non and, and, and uh, treated RA uh, lesions, so that's not possible, for the time being at least. <laughs> Is we are wondering what is chemotherapy really doing? If only uh, that's pretty striking. Um, patients benefit if they're T cells. What, what is really chemotherapy effect? We only have few samples from patients that have received chemotherapy and where we have large uh, sections that we can analyze. But what we see is in those patients that respond to chemotherapy, we see then an influx of T cells that come into contact with the tumor epithelium. So there is something happening, and we see after time, that sort of this rearrangement, so the tumor comes back in that sense, rearranged, pushes away these T cells, and sort of reorganizes into the fashion, as we have shown that here. Mm -hmm. So there's a dynamic uh, that we can view, but the number of um, cases that we can view in that detailed fashion is, of course, very low. So we are questioning, is, is chemotherapy hitting tumor cells, or are we more modulating um, environment? That's really what, what needs to be. So chemotherapy hits everything. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's a, yeah, we cannot delineate for the time being. It's not possible. Last question here. Uh, my question is regarding, did you observe any different phenotypes in the metastasis sites that you are actually investigating? Yeah. Because eventually finding a, a big difference like the one that you showed in patients where they had T-cell infiltration uh, sure would have to do with different subpopulations or something. So did you observe that? And if so, what was the most characteristic phenotype that you could identify that caused that big difference? So one thing that came as a big surprise is that there are practically no FOXP3 positive T cells there. They are practically absent in the liver lesions. And the vast majority of the cells that we see here are CD8 and CD4s, and they are 50-50 in proportion that you can see them there. So that's the largest fraction of the T cell population that we see then here. There are no NK cells. They are completely absent from early on in colorectal cancer, and uh, especially in the metastatic situation. They don't play a role here. Well, Niels, thanks a lot. Um, we come to the